In this video, I'm going to show you how to enforce design rules in your code using architecture tests. These are automated tests that are simple to write and they can quickly validate that your code follows the design rules that you put in place. What are some rules that you can enforce using architecture tests? For example, you can check that the classes implementing an entity are sealed at the same time. You can check that all of your entities have a private constructor and that they use a static factory method to create a new instance. You can also use architecture tests to verify that all the properties on your domain entities have private setters or no setters at all, meaning they are immutable. And you can also use architecture tests to verify naming conventions of the types in your domain. Of course, this doesn't have to be specific to the domain project. Architecture tests can apply to your entire application. I'm just using the domain as the example. So let's start by writing our first architecture test. I'm going to install a NuGet package that's going to allow me to write my architecture tests. And the library that I'm looking for is called netarctest.rules. This library exposes a fluent API that you can use to enforce your architectural rules in your unit tests. So I'm going to go ahead and install the latest version and let's see how we're going to write our first architecture test. I'll be writing the tests for my domain project, so I'll put them in the domain folder. And let's create a new class that's going to hold our test cases I will call it domain tests. So let's start off with a simple test case. I'm going to write a test to verify that all the domain events in my domain assembly are sealed types. So I'll say public void and I'll give this test a name. Let's call it domain events should be sealed. This is a descriptive name for my unit test. And then how am I going to write this test? Well, the entry point for the netArcTest rules library is the types class. And this exposes a couple of methods that you can use to load a set of types. Now the simplest approach is using the inAssembly method and specify the domain assembly. So I'm going to define the domain assembly as a private static read-only field on the domain test class. So let me create it. So private static read-only, it's going to be the assembly type which is in the system reflection namespace, and let's call it the domain assembly. And then how I'm going to actually get this assembly is for example, by saying type of NED, I will have to add a reference to the domain project to be able to import a using statement for this type, and then I can access the assembly that contains this type. With this, I can continue writing my architecture test by specifying the domain assembly in the inAssembly method. And now this gives me a collection of types in this assembly and I can continue writing my architecture test. So I will call the that method to define a predicate of a more specific set of types that I want to select and I'm looking for domain events. So I will say types in assembly of the domain assembly that implement the interface and I can specify the iDomain event interface, and then I can write my rule. So I can say should be sealed, and you'll see that this library already supports many of the most common assertions that you want to do. And then how you run the test is by saying get result. This is going to return back a test result that you can store inside of a field, and then you can verify the state of this result by checking the is successful flag or if the failing types are an empty collection. So I'll say is successful should be true. So I'll reference the fluent assertions namespace and use the extension methods to write my assertion. So this is my first test case, checking that the domain events defined in the domain assembly are sealed types. So let's run this test and see what results we get back. So you'll see that my test passes and this is because I have just one implementation of the domain event interface which is the user created domain event. So if I were to remove the sealed keyword from this record and rerun my test, you would see that it's going to fail which means that our test is actually working and it's important that you test the negative test cases or you might end up with inconsistent tests. So let's return back the sealed keyword. Let's make sure that our test is passing again and you see that this is the case. And let's see how we're going to write our next 
architecture test for another design rule that I want to enforce. I mentioned that you can use architecture tests to enforce naming conventions in your project. So that's what I'm going to do with the next test that I'm going to write. So I'll say domain events should have the domain event postfix. So with this test, I want to enforce a rule that all implementations of the domain event interface should have a type name ending with domain event. So let's see how we're going to write this test. I'll create a variable to hold the result of my test assertion and I'll say types in assembly. I'll pass in the domain assembly and then I'm going to write a predicate to select any types that implement the iDomainEvent interface. And then I want to write my assertion and I'll say should have a name ending with and I can define what is the name that I'm expecting. So in this case, I want to check that they have a name ending with domain event and we can obtain the test result for this test case. Now I can verify that result is successful, should be true, and this is enough to enforce my naming convention using an architecture test. So let's go ahead and run our tests to see if they will both still be passing. You can see that both of the tests are green, which means that our test seems to be working. So let's verify that by updating the name of the domain event. So let's say I wanted to use a different naming convention without the domain event postfix, and I just specify the name of the event in the past tense. In this case, I will call it user created. This is another naming convention that you will often see when working with events. And in this case, my test should fail. So I'm running my tests again, and you'll see that my test enforcing the domain event naming convention is failing. So now that I know that my test is working as expected, I can go ahead and revert this change to user created domain event. And I'm going to check that my test is passing now. And you can see the test is green. So this is how I'm going to leave it. Now I'm going to write a test targeting the entities in my domain. And I want to check that all of my entities contain a private parameterless constructor. So I'll say entities should have private parameterless constructor. So this is the name of my test. And now let's see how I'm going to implement this. This time I'm going to take a slightly different approach and we're going to use the NetArc test library to obtain the collection of types that are domain entities. So I'll say entity types, this will be the variable holding my entity types, and I'll say types in assembly, I'll specify the domain assembly, and then I'm going to create my predicate, where I will say I want the types in the domain assembly that inherit the entity class. So this is going to give me back all of the types satisfying this condition, and then I can use this collection of types to write the body of my test. So here's how I'm going to implement this. I'll create another variable that's going to hold a list of types representing any domain entities that do not satisfy this test. Now what I want to do is to iterate over the entity types and to actually get the specific types, you need to call the getTypes method and this is going to return an enumerable of types. And now I can write my for each loop and specify the entity types. Now what I want to do is go ahead and grab a list of constructors on my entity type by saying entity type and we call the get constructors method but we need to specify some binding flags to this method. So I will look for non-public constructors and I want them to be instance constructors not static ones. And now I can check this list of constructors to see if there are any of them inside that satisfy the condition of being a private parameterless constructor. I'll do this by saying constructors and I will call the any method from the link library and I'll say look for any constructors that are private and if I access the constructor parameter information and call the get parameters method and the length is equal to zero, then I have the constructor that I'm looking for. If the opposite of this is true, so I'll negate this expression, I'm going to add this entity type to my failing types list. So let me do that. And then at the end of my test, I'm going to say failing types should be 
empty. Otherwise, my test isn't satisfied and some of my NED classes don't contain a private parameterless constructor. Let's go ahead and run this test and then I'll explain why this kind of test might be useful. So you'll see that my test is failing, and if I check the message here, and Fluent Assertions prints out very user-friendly messages, you'll see that it says expected failing types to be empty, but found a single type inside, and this type is my user entity. So if I head over to the user entity, you can confirm that it does not contain a private parameterless constructor. So let's go ahead and add one. So I'll say private user, no parameters and the body of this constructor is empty. Now you'll see that I'm getting a compile error and this is because I'm inheriting from the NED abstract class which also doesn't have a private parameterless constructor. So I'll define one and make it protected so that it can be accessed from the user class and now with this in place you'll see that the private parameterless constructor in the user type is no longer causing a compile error. If I run my test, you'll see that the test is now passing. So my test is actually working and verifying the design rule that I want to enforce. And now I want to mention why this kind of constructor is useful. The main reason is serialization and deserialization of your entities. For example, if you are using an ORM like Entity Framework Core, it's going to need access to a constructor to be able to hydrate your entity instances when materializing them from the database. And the simplest solution for this is just exposing a private parameterless constructor, EF Core will be able to call it and materialize your NED instance. You don't want to make this constructor public because then you will be breaking the constraints of your entity. So let's recap what we have until now. I have a test verifying that my domain events need to be sealed. This is useful because if you decorate your types as sealed, you'll get a performance boost and you are expressing your intent by saying that domain events should not be inherited. Then I'm checking for a naming convention on my domain event types and I'm verifying that my entities have a private parameterless constructor that's going to be used by EF Core or serialization libraries, for example, anything working with JSON. And now I want to show you one more type of test that's really practical and this is an actual architecture test. So I'm going to create another class that's going to hold my test cases and I will call this layer tests. If your architecture has a specific set of rules for how you should structure your projects, you can verify that the references are correctly put in place using architecture tests. In this case, I want to verify that my domain project should not have any other dependencies. So I'm going to call this test domain should not have dependency on application. So in this case, I'm obviously referring to the application layer of the clean architecture where I already have in place the domain layer of the clean architecture and I want to enforce this architecture rule using an automated test. So you would write this test in a similar way as the previous test that you saw and I need to specify the domain assembly to start out. A simple solution to this would be going to the domain tests class and copying the domain assembly to my layer tests so that I can use it there. But when I see duplication like this, it's a good opportunity to introduce a base class for a test. So let's create a base test class that's going to hold this reference to the domain assembly. So I'll call it base test, it's going to be public and abstract and it's going to have a static read-only field which is going to be my domain assembly. Of course I'm going to make this protected so that it's accessible from the tests implementing the base test and then I'm going to update my domain tests to inherit from the base test class and I can get rid of the local definition of the domain assembly field. Then I can do the same in my layer tests so I will inherit from the base test class and I'm going to get rid of the local domain assembly field. And now I can continue writing my architecture test. So I'm going to say types in assembly and specify the domain assembly and I'll say should not have a dependency on and then you can specify a namespace that the types in the domain assembly should not have a reference to. So let's say that my root namespace for the application project is called application. This is what I'm going to specify in my test and my test is going to verify that any type in the domain assembly does not have a reference to this namespace. Now I can say get result to obtain a test result 
and store it in a variable. And you can use this approach to write some very rich test cases. For example, you can make sure that your use cases aren't referencing any framework core or something similar. To finish off this test case, I'm going to say result is successful, should be true, because I'm not expecting to have a reference to this namespace. And now if I run my architecture tests again, you will see that all of them are passing, including our test checking that our domain assembly does not have a dependency on the application. If I wanted this test to fail, I could go ahead and create an application project in my solution, add a reference to it from the domain, and add a using statement for the application namespace. And then my architecture test would fail, letting me know that I'm breaking my dependency rule and I'm not following the clean architecture in this example. I hope you enjoyed this video about using architecture tests to enforce design rules in your code. And if you want to learn more about architecture tests, you can watch this video next make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons and until next time stay awesome